All right, so everyone say hi to Hadley. Hey, Hadley. We miss you, Hadley. And we will also uh, have a prayer for your family as well. So let us pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd be with the Ackerman family. Give them uh, recovery from their illness. Keep them healthy and safe. And, uh, and keep them in your loving care at all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okie dokie. So, we are <clears throat> at the heart of the Christian faith. So, I think we've talked a little bit before about how the catechism can kind of be thought about as the, the, the first chief part, the first main part is the Ten Commandments. The second chief part is the Creed, that is the Apostles' Creed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the, the third part, the third chief part is the Lord's Prayer. The sacraments, baptism, absolution, and the Lord's Supper, kind of fit under the third article of the Creed, which talks about the forgiveness of sins and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so if you think about the, the last three chief parts as part of the third article, what this ends up doing then is you have the Ten Commandments first, the first article of the Creed, then you have the second article of the Creed, the third article of the Creed, and the, the Lord's Prayer. In that case then, the very middle point would be the second article of the Creed. And that would be a, a great way of looking at it because the second article of the Creed, which deals with Jesus, is the heart of and soul and center of our Christian faith. That's why we are Christians, because we follow Christ. And we are about to celebrate Christmas, which comes from the word Christ plus Mass. And Mass was an old way of describing the worship service. It was called the Mass. And so Christ Mass was the worship service on the day celebrating the birth of Jesus, December 25th. So that's where you get Christmas. Was Jesus really born on December 25th? Uh, almost certainly not, but that was the traditional date that somewhere in the early church they settled on. But yeah. it's we can ask when we get to heaven. It's, it's very unlikely that it was on that day. Uh, I would say there's a one out of 365 chance that it was on that, that particular day. Okay, so we are on... <laughs> All right, we're on page 57, study guide 16. And we're discussing Christ in the state, his state of humiliation. So, uh, what are the two natures in Christ, Valerie? Okay, good. Yeah, he's got a divine nature and a human nature. His human nature begins at the time when he is incarnate. The Son of God takes on human flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So, divine means his God nature. Human means, obviously, his flesh and blood, body and soul, human nature. What is John 1, 14, Madeline? Good. So, all right, that's all right. John 1 begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, uh, so, so the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that sounds extremely confusing, but what it means is the Word was with God the Father, and the Word was God because it was God the Son, and then the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, was with the Father and the Son uh, then as well. Okay. Um, some people call the Holy Spirit the shy person in the Trinity. Uh, he doesn't show up a whole lot, but uh, 
his, his work, he specifically says in John 14 that the Holy Spirit comes to teach us about Jesus, and then Jesus is the one who leads us to the Father. So I'm pretty sure, I know for a fact the Holy Spirit doesn't feel left out. He, uh, he's, he's um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are eternally, um, they eternally dwell together in harmony and peace and love for one another. Okay, so, uh, the Word was in the beginning with God, and John 1, 14, the verse you just quoted, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory. So that's a reference to the eternal Son of God, begotten, not made, of the same substance with the Father, becoming a man for us men and for our salvation. Okay, what about Isaiah 9, 6, Janet? So you didn't write the, these two verses? Okay. All right. Well, it is for, have you ever heard of Handel's Messiah? Uh, alleluia, alleluia. You know that? No? You've heard it before? Yeah. But anyway, part of Handel's Messiah, this very famous work um, about the life of Jesus, is for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So that's Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So that verse describes the two natures in Jesus very well. For unto us a child is born, describes his flesh and blood, human nature. The fact that he is mighty God indicates his divine nature. So it is a very clear truth from the Bible that the Son of God became a man, Jesus Christ, who is a divine and a human nature. There are some people today, well, many people today really, who reject that teaching, who don't believe it. They believe that Jesus was only a man. He was a really important man that God created and sent in order to, you know, do good things for us and teach us how to be good people. But they don't believe that he's also the Son of God along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But as Christians, we believe what the Bible teaches that he certainly is. Do they still celebrate Christmas? Um, you know, yet some of the groups that believe Jesus is not truly God do sorry celebrate Christmas the Mormons if you've heard of the Mormons the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints those are that is one group that teaches Jesus is not truly God and they don't believe that there's a that the Father and the Holy Spirit are the other two persons of the Trinity um, but and then, and they do celebrate Christmas because they they believe that there was a man Jesus. They don't believe that he was the Son of God um, who was born, and they celebrate his birth. And they believe some parts of the Bible. There's another group called the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they don't celebrate Christmas. They don't believe in celebrating um, holidays like that. But they also don't believe Jesus is truly God. They only believe that he was a really good man. Okay, so, uh, Jana, 2A, why did Jesus become a man? Good. To act in our place under God's law and fulfill it for us, and this is called his act of obedience. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says, When time was full, God sent his Son to be born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those of us who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as God's sons. So, the Son of God, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, are God, and they are the lawgivers. So, they're above the law. So, they're not under the rules that we're under. They're the ones who make the rules. So, in order for someone to fulfill the law perfectly for us, to obey God's commandment or demand that the law be fulfilled, we needed, somebody, we needed someone who, who could do it perfectly, who was under the law. 
And so that's why the Son of God takes up human flesh and becomes part of our creation so that he's under the law and he obeys it for us. This is called his act of obedience. All right, so that's the first reason that the Son of God needed to be a man. So why else did the Son of God need to become a man named Jesus Valerie B? He needed to be able to suffer and die for our guilt because he failed to keep the law, act of obedience. Right. So God in his nature is immortal. Immortal means not dying or not killable, right? Not can't die. So, in his, uh, so God, in his divine nature, cannot die. Therefore, in order for him to offer that sacrifice to pay for our sins, God had to become a man so that he could give up his life, sacrifice his life for us. And he did this because we had failed to keep the law. So this is his passive obedience. This is what he endures or suffers in order to redeem us. Okay, so why did Jesus have to be true God, Madeline? Uh, yeah, so that his fulfilling of the law and his suffering and death would be a sufficient ransom for all people. Psalm forty nine seven says, "No human, no." regular human like us can give our life for another to prevent that other person from dying. So let's say somebody burst in with a gun and I jumped up and ran at them and tackled them and incapacitated them, but they shot me in the process and I saved all three of your lives. People would call me a lifesaver, right? And you would you would be thankful that I was here to save your life from this really bad person. But what, even if I would have saved you from that being attacked, what, what's still going to happen eventually to all of us? We're all still going to die, right? So one person can't etern forever save the life of another person, even if I might be able to save the lives of some people. So that's why I don't think that we should call doctors and firefighters and paramedics lifesavers we should call them death delayers, death delayers. exactly <laughs> i've said that before right no well that's that's what i, I like i like uh, to call it, death delayers um yeah well we're just putting it off we're kicking it have you ever heard the expression, kicking the can down the road? Just putting it off for a while longer. Okay. Or delaying the inevitable is another way of putting it. Just putting the trash can. <laughs> right? Okay, so, um, so Psalm 49 verse 7 says, No one can give his life as a ransom for another. But Mark 10, 45, Jesus says there, The Son of Man, that is God's son who became a man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, or actually the many, the masses, to give his life as a ransom for all people, to save us from our sins. And so only the death of the man who is God could be sufficient enough to pay for all of our sins. And that's exactly what he does. Okay, what's then be the other thing that um, he needed to be God for? To overcome death and like the Yeah, to overcome death and the devil for us. So 1 Corinthians 15 says, Death, where is your sting? Death, is, there, death where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is through Jesus Christ that we receive victory over death, a victory that we could never have achieved on our own. Um, yeah, and in Hebrews 
Yeah, question. If God knows everything, then why would he still make human beings if he knew what we would do? If he knew that we were going to sin? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, um, it's, a, it's really an impossible question to answer because in order to answer it, we'd have to know exactly what's inside of God's head. So all we know is what he tells us in the Bible. And he doesn't ever answer that question directly. Um, what we do know, though, is what happened, <laughs> that he did create us, that he did give us the ability either to love and obey him or to reject him. Okay, So he gave us that ability. If he hadn't given us that, that ability, we would just kind of like be robots, right? We'd be like computer programs or androids. You know, we would not have any sort of ability to really choose anything. So in that case, then we really wouldn't, um, you know, actively choose to love God either. Um, in, so some people think that maybe in, in such a world where nobody had any choice whatsoever, love wouldn't even be a possibility because love really is a decision to, to shower your kindness and affection upon another human being. So that's one way of thinking about it, is that if God, if God would have made us in some way where we couldn't sin, then how would we be able to love him? Okay. Um, but what we do know is that Adam and Eve, of course, chose wrong, and we've been choosing wrong ever since. But John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his son, so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So once... The sin did happen. God doesn't sit around and do nothing. But because what he could have done at that point is he could have just wiped out the world and started over. You ever play video games? You know, you just hit the reset button and it just starts over. Well, God could have done that with the world. But in fact, what he does do is not hit the reset button, but he redeems it or saves the world through his son, Jesus Christ. So um, I think that you're asking a question that is a mystery. It's not something we can really completely understand. Um, because there's a lot of questions we can ask God. Why this? Why that? And we'll get to ask him when we get to, get to heaven. But in the meantime, we just have to trust what his word says. So, good question. All right, so yeah, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says that because we as human beings have flesh and blood, the Son of God took on human flesh and blood so that through his death he could destroy the power of the devil, the, the devil who had the power over us of um, uh, the fear of death. So Jesus has taken away from us that fear of death because through his suffering, death, and resurrection, he has won the victory for us over sin, death, and the devil. Okay, so those are the, um, the reasons why the Son of God became a man and why, he, why our Redeemer needed to be true God. So, what are the three main tasks or offices of Christ for A, B, and C? Who are we on? Are we on Janus still? You answer the last one? Okay, back to Valerie. Prophet, priest, and king. Yes, prophet, priest, and king. And these three offices in the Old Testament were ones in which the God set, chose or set apart these people to serve in their, their offices by anointing them. Okay? So he anointed them to, to be his, his chosen servants in these roles. And Jesus in the New Testament is our prophet, priest, and king because Acts 10.38 says that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit in his baptism. And the Holy Spirit descends as a dove and lands on him. At that point, he was anointed or, or the Holy Spirit was poured out on him. And he has an unlimited, the un, an unlimited supply of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I did want to back up one for one minute. Yes, he's got an unlimited. He he can he can give the Holy Spirit to whoever he wants. But if he has unlimited, does that mean we have limited? Well, none of us can ever completely.
possess God because God is bigger than us, right? And so we can never, while God dwells in us, we can never actually completely possess him, okay? But Jesus, John's Gospel says, Jesus has the Holy Spirit without measure, that is, un, in an unlimited way, because he is united with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Son is united with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, I have a second question. Okay. Is he the only one who was baptized, like, only one who's Trinity? Yes, he's the only one who was baptized because he is the only one who has human flesh. So the Father and the Holy Spirit don't have flesh. They're just spirit. And so they, um, they, they don't, um, they don't, that while they participate in the world, they do so in a spiritual way through speaking, through working on our hearts and minds, but they don't do so in a physical way. So I wanted to back up for a second and talk about the baptism of Jesus and the transfiguration of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus testifies to the divine and human natures of Jesus. Jesus stands in the water and has water poured over him as John the Baptist baptizes him. So that's his human nature. I wonder why he's called John the Baptist. John the Baptizer, right? He's the one who baptizes. By the way, the reason he's called the Baptist is not because he was the founder of the Baptist Church. That's a later title that comes up. But yeah, John the Baptizer or John the Baptist is the one who baptizes. Uh, God sent him to do this to prepare the way for Jesus. So, at his baptism, the Father says from above, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So we have the Father speaking that this is the, the Son of God. And then the Holy Spirit comes down and lands on him like a dove. At the, at the transfiguration of Jesus, we see the human Jesus Christ standing there on the mountain, and his face and his clothes are transformed to be glorious and bright. So the humanity is seen there, but then also the glory, which John spoke of in John 1, 14, right? Wait, you're saying John the Baptist Jesus? That would be a different John. So John the Baptist actually is killed... Um, I guess probably during the first year of Jesus' ministry, uh, Her King Herod has him beheaded. So John the Baptist becomes a martyr. Why did they kill John? John, who was just a Baptist. What did he do? Well, John the Baptist not only baptized, but he also called on people to repent. And King Herod had um, stolen his brother's wife away from him. He had forced his brother's wife to divorce and then he had married her so John had said you you should not do that you need to repent and fix this problem so uh, um, that's what got John in a bunch of hot water because he was calling on Herod to repent to turn away from his sin okay um, Yes, and then, the, yeah, the transfiguration of Jesus at that, that event as well. The Father says from above, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. And he adds these words, listen to him. So as Christians, we are to always listen to the words of Jesus and put them into practice. Uh, okay, yeah. So Jesus um, then is our prophet, priest, and king. So in the Old Testament... The prophets primarily did what, Madeline? Um, they preached Christ and went on earth. Okay, so yeah, they preached. So the main role of prophets was to call people back to the word of God. So, he, so they preached, they reminded people of what God taught in the Old Testament. And sometimes the prophets received visions or oracles or revelations about the future and they would write those things down and then pass them on to God's people and Jesus then will end up doing exactly the same thing uh, three uh, five a why is Christ considered a prophet okay good yeah because he preached about God he made God known 
Also, <laughs> probably the simplest answer would be because the Bible calls him a prophet. Uh, it specifically says that he is, is a prophet. Um, he just is. Yeah, he just is. And, you know, God, God says that he is, so he definitely is. So, B, then, how does God carry out, or how does Christ carry out his office as prophet today? Ba uh, Valerie. Very good. Yeah. Um, through the preaching of the gospel today, through the administration of the sacraments, through the scriptures, through the Bible, he continues to preach to us today. <clears throat> All right. Six. What did Christ do as priest, Madeline? Yeah, you can do all three. Yeah, good. So in the Old Testament, the priests were responsible for a, a number of things. One, they were responsible for taking the word of God that came in Leviticus and for putting it into practice in the sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrificial system. So they would offer sacrifices to God. They also would pray on behalf of the people, which is another word for intercession or pleading with God. So they would pray to God. They'd call upon God's name and ask for God's help. And one other thing that the priests in the Old Testament would do is they would bless God's people. So in Numbers chapter 6, God told the priests, when you, I want you to put my name on, your, your, on my people. I want you to put my name on my people this way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That should sound familiar. I like that part. Yeah. Yeah, is it because it's the end of the service? No. <laughs> I do too. I do too. Um, and that that part, like um, other parts of the service, like the invocation, we can also make the sign of the cross at that point too. Like in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When the pastor does this, then you can likewise make that sign on yourself when he does it uh, as well then. Okay. But yes, it is a wonderful part of the service. Um, we shouldn't skip out of church before the blessing. Oh, sometimes people want to sneak away a little bit early. Maybe that's part of it, yeah. Well, I guess that, that can happen, right? But if we can, if we can, we should stay for, for at least the blessing. Um, okay, so... That was another function. The priests would speak the name of God onto the people, and they would be blessed through that speaking. So Jesus comes to do those things as well. He enacts or fulfills God's law perfectly. He sacrifices himself for our sins, and he still pleads for us with the Father or intercedes for us at the Father's right hand. And then he also continues through the ministry to bless us and speak his word to us. Then uh, finally, kings, which I don't have a question on that here. In the Old Testament, kings were anointed or chosen to lead God's people, okay? To lead the people, to judge his people, and to fight for his people. And so as king for us today... Jesus fights the devil and the satanic horde for us. He continues to lead us through his word. And he will come on the last day to judge the living and the dead. So the role of Christ as king, uh, he specifically says when the king comes in his glory and all of his angels with him, then he'll sit on his glorious throne, that is his judgment seat, and he'll separate the sheep from the goats. Where's sheep What's that? I am Jesus' little goat. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm a little lamb, right? If uh, and what's a little goat called? 
a kid, right? So I'm not little Jesus, Jesus' little kid. I'm Jesus' little lamb. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk now on number seven about the stages of Christ's humiliation in order of occurrence on the stair steps below. So this corresponds to the his state of humiliation in the creed. So, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was, one, conceived by the Holy Spirit, two, born of the Virgin Mary, three, suffered under Pontius Pilate, four, was crucified, died, and then five, he died, and six, he was buried. Now, I'm going to go ahead and answer number eight for you, because if you just look up humiliation in the dictionary or defined it based on just how the word is used today, you probably wrote something like humiliation means to be embarrassed. It's what? What is it? Yes, the act of, of humiliating or being humiliated. All right, so the thing is, in catechism, in Christian theology, the state of humiliation for Jesus isn't about being embarrassed or humiliated. Rather, it's related to him humbling himself. So the related word there would be humi humility. And so we use the word humiliate today to mean to run someone down, embarrass them, make them feel really bad about themselves. While that does happen to Jesus when he is, that's all right, no big deal, when he's beaten, when he's flogged, when he's crucified, and most likely Jesus was naked when he was crucified because the Romans would, to add to the humiliation, they would crucify their victims naked. Um, while those are humiliating things, the state of humiliation for Jesus is larger than that. It involves him humbling himself to take up human flesh and go all the way to the point of dying on the cross. And he and actually calls him a slave. So he, was, he became the lowest rung of society. He became a non-citizen. He became rejected, despised by men. Um, so humiliation here means to Jesus humbled himself and did not always use or fully use his divine power. Okay? So that's the answer I want. The humiliation of Jesus means that as a man, he did not always or fully use his divine power, but he laid those powers aside in order to um, live under the law as a, a, a human being just like the rest of us. Now there are times when he will use his divine glory. He will manifest his divine glory. But usually his state of humiliation means that he humbles himself and does not use his glory. Number nine, how was Jesus conceived? Who are we on now? Back to the beginning. They teach that Christ, the Son of God, received a true human body and soul from the Virgin Mary through the miracle power of the Holy Spirit, not through a human body. Good. So, yeah. <clears throat> the Son of God becomes a man in the womb, or tummy, of the Virgin Mary. Womb is another word for the uterus. The uterus is the part of the female anatomy where the baby grows. Uh, so anyway, yeah, in the, in the womb or, or the uterus, the Holy Spirit miraculously put baby Jesus in there without a, a man being involved. So in the normal course of things in this life, a man and a woman have babies together. But in Jesus' case, there is no human father. 
And this is significant because if Jesus had a human father, this means that he would have been born in the image of his father, just like back in Genesis 5, Seth was born in the image of Adam. So Genesis 5 tells us that when God created Adam and Eve, he made man, he made humans in the image and likeness of God. But then Adam and Eve sinned. And after that, Seth and all subsequent children are born in the image and likeness of their own fathers. And that image and likeness means sinner. So in order for the Son of God to take up human flesh without sin, it was necessary for him to be born of a virgin mother not by, and, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, not through the normal means of human procreation. Behold, the virgin shall conceive in her womb and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. A virgin is a woman who's never had sexual relations with a man and therefore cannot be pregnant. But in this particular case, it is a miracle of the Holy Spirit putting the virgin, putting, putting the Son of God into the womb of the virgin. Um, okay, now <clears throat> Jesus was oftentimes humiliated. I wouldn't say he was embarrassed, but he was humiliated in his life. How was Jesus treated in his earthly life? Go ahead and do 10. A, B, and C, Madeline. Uh, first, he suffered poverty, compassion, well, that was the suffer, uh, and persecution. And then he suffered in great agony, he under Pontius Pilate, and then he died in agony. Good. So he suffered poverty and contempt. <clears throat> he suffered under Pontius Pilate, and he died in agony, suffering under God's wrath for our sins. Out of love for us. What's that? It is good when you're contented, that's right. Yeah. Did you get popsicle sticks and, like, what the teachers use? They put your name on a popsicle stick and then they put it in the cup and then you draw the popsicle stick. And then that's the person who answers the question. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. Is that a special door behind you? That door? Yeah. That is the, um, for the Christmas program? Um, that's the door to the inn. You You've been married, right? Were you married last year? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's the that's the door to the end. And so of course you go through the door and then you go up onto the stage and that's where we keep the manger up there. It's a good special door. <laughs> the the manger sitting back behind there. It's kind of sad we don't get to do the program this year. It's a special door. You can't go through it. No. Um, okay. So define redemption, Janet. Okay, good, being saved, yeah. It, um, it has the sense of um, to be bought back, to be purchased back. So our redemption involves us being placed under the anger of God against our sin. And so Jesus, through his holy, precious blood and innocent suffering and death, pays to the Father his perfect obedience and his blood and righteousness as the perfect sacrifice to redeem us, that is to buy us back out from under sin, death, and the law. And also to release us from the devil's power, because the devil had us in bondage as well. Um, yeah, now redemption can also have the sense of ransoming. So, um, there, the idea is that somebody has, has got you enslaved, and the only way out is to buy you out of that slavery. So that's one of the other images that God gives us for, for our, our saving. Also, rescue can also have the sense of rescue. But yes, being saved is good as well. All these terms go together. Redemption, salvation, ransoming, rescue, deliverance. Okay, why did Christ humble himself, Valerie? Christ voluntarily humbled himself in order to redeem me a lost and condemned person. Good. He humbled himself in order to redeem me, a lost and condemned sinner, person. All right. From what has Christ redeemed you, Madeline? From sin, death, and power of the devil. 
Good. So John 1.29 says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So if my sin is no longer on me, but Jesus has carried it away and died for it, then it's no longer on me. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says that through the power, through, through his death, he delivered us from the fear of death and defeated the devil by his own death so that the devil can no longer accuse me and convince me that I'm lost. Okay, how did Christ redeem you? A, Jana? Yes, so he took my guilt and punishment on the cross. I deserve to go up to the cross and suffer and die and be sent to hell for eternity. Jesus suffers that for me on the, Christ, on the cross. And what else did he redeem? How did, else did he redeem me? He freed me from slavery of sin. Mm -hmm. Yep, he freed me from the slavery of sin. John 8, 36 says, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. How has Christ redeemed you from death, Madeline? He gave me eternal life. Okay. He gave me eternal life, yeah. So he suffered, died, and rose for me, and he triumphed over death so that I don't have to be fearful of death, and I can be assured that my sins are forgiven. How has Christ saved you from the power of the devil, Jana? He conquered the devil so that the devil can no longer accuse me of my sins. And now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can resist the devil's temptations. Okay, so with what has Christ purchased and redeemed me? Yes, very good. He's redeemed me with his holy precious blood. And with his innocent suffering and death. And he's done this so that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. So he has redeemed me so that I follow him and live under him in, and will enjoy forever his kingdom. How does this work of redemption benefit you, Madeline? He's the price so you don't have to go through all these horrible things. So that's the benefit. Okay, yeah. So he took my place. So he he was my substitute. So he took my place under God's wrath and judgment, paid my penalty, that is, he atoned and made satisfaction for my sins. This is called the vicarious atonement. A, vi a vicar is a substitute. So vicarious atonement means that he, he suffered and died in my place. And Jana, has Christ redeemed only you? Yeah. So this is called the universal atonement or the universal redemption. 2 Corinthians 5.15 specifically says that Christ died for all. So there are some groups that teach that Christ only died for the people that are going to be saved eventually. But if that's the case, then John 3.16 wouldn't work. God so loved the world that he gave his son. God loved, in 1 John 2, says that Jesus is the propitiation or sacrifice for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Also for the whole world. Um, however, the, um, the benefits of Christ's redemption are only received one way, and that is through faith, through trusting, believing that what Jesus did benefits me. If I say to Jesus, I don't need your redemption, I'm good, I'm, I'm good on my own, I can work my way into heaven, that's one way of rejecting the redemption of Jesus. If I say, I don't believe that I have any sins that need to be paid for, or I don't believe in God at all, that's another way of re rejecting the redemption. <laughs> um, 
this is yeah. So I, I that's another way of rejecting the redemption. But the but the way of receiving the benefits of the redemption is saying, Jesus, I believe that what you did on the cross was for me. I believe that you love me. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. I am Jesus' little <laughs> calf, kid. Lamb, right? I am Jesus' little lamb. Jesus says, I know my own and my own know me. I give them eternal life and nothing can snatch them out of my hand. Okay, uh, Valerie, define the word exaltation. Exaltation means to raise in rank and honor. Okay, it means to raise in honor. And so, Jesus bottoms out in his state of humiliation when he dies and is buried. But because of his obedience and because of God's promises and God always keeps his word, therefore he was exalted. God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what this means now is that he's exalted as both man and God are Christ fully and always uses his divine power. He fully and always uses his divine power. Okay, what does the word descent mean? Uh, are we back to Valerie? No. Madeline? To go down. Yes, descent simply means going down, right? You descend the stairs. So, Jana, why is Christ's descent into hell part of his exaltation, not part of his humiliation? Yeah, so he saved us from our sins, and so the descent into hell is when Jesus goes down and proclaims his victory over the devil, and basically taunts the devil and says, Nah, 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 I beat you. I conquered you, right? It's like his victory parade. Jesus marches through hell and and, and parades through and proclaims his victory. So that's why the descent into hell is part of Christ's exaltation, not part of his humiliation. Okay, that is the end of study guide 16. So we will take our quiz then. I'm not going to get to see y'all for a while. So, I'm going to miss y'all too. So, we have... Um, uh, we'll not have class again until January 6th. So that'll be three weeks from today when we have our next class. So Christmas Eve service. We have a 4 o'clock service and a 6 o'clock service, so there's more room to spread out. Um, and Christmas Day service is at 9. Uh, I guess that's it. So let me turn off the video. Merry Christmas, Hadley.